Hello, everyone. This is Ali Siratan from thinkinginproductions.com. As these prophetic events are suddenly unfolding in our world, um, in the land of the covenant, in the holy land, Israel, and uh, this war that's broken out, and the Lord is giving us revelation uh, concerning what is happening, I'm just um, sharing with you my meditations. Um, this particular message is about the timing, the timing of the Lord. There's so many signaling systems that seem to have been turned on. Um, when you look at the first chapter of the Bible, the book of Genesis, it says in verse 14, then God said, let lights in the expanse of the sky be separating the day from the night. They will be for signs, for signs, for seasons, and for days and years. Now, days and years, everybody knows what that means. God is essentially creating a calendar. Um, seasons, the word is moed, or in plural moedim, which are, these are the appointed days of the Lord. So basically, God creates a calendar uh, that he hands down later through Moses. But the basis of this calendar is this relationship between the earth, the sun, and the moon. And God declares from the beginning that he had these days in mind. So even before... You know, the story of the Garden of Eden happened, even the story of the Bible happened. God already had in mind these appointed days, which have a purpose for, you know, the plan of redemption and the establishment of the royal priesthood, which is at the heart of um, the government of God in, in the heavens and on the earth, you know, in the midst of the universe and beyond. And this planet is the birthplace of the immortal sons and daughters of God. So the appointed days and for signs. What are the signs? Ot in Hebrew, it means signaling. There's a signaling system, you know, like there was an eclipse when the Lord was lifted up on the tree of sacrifice. So there is this uh, idea that God sometimes uses the sun and the moon as a signaling system uh, to us. And we should pay attention to that as well as these appointed days. You know, everyone knows that um, the children of Israel left Egypt uh, on the night of the Passover. Uh, and later we know that this freedom from bondage, you know, the Lord was himself uh, crucified on the Passover. Uh, so we now know he was the Passover lamb. The appointed day came to life once again and had this deeply spiritual significance, you know, uh, lifting up the cup of the wine. He was in the tomb during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, the second day of this seven-day feast. The Passover is a seven-day feast, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then he was in, uh, rose from the dead on the third day of it, the Feast of first fruits, And that's why Paul says he's the first fruit risen from the dead. And then the Holy Spirit came on Shavuot or Pentecost, which is 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 49 days plus one. The plus one begins a new something new, you know, the appointment. And then there are these feast days on the fall. And you think, why am I saying this to you? Because there's a signaling system that has been activated clearly um, in the course of the events that are just unfolding before our eyes. So this particular attack, this surprise attack, happens on one of these appointed days that are in the fall, because there's three in the spring, one in the summer, and three in the fall. And then there's the weekly Sabbath. Um, the weekly Sabbath is actually one of these official appointed days that God marks on the calendar. It commemorates the day of rest, but also the day of worship in the cycle of creation. There are six days of creation and one day of worship. The seven completes the cycle. And every week on the seventh day, we remember, you know, every week is a new creation. Every week we remember the hand of God and we meditate and, and commune with the Lord and rest, uh, imitating the fact that the Lord rested from his works. And so this day is, the Sabbath is, is everything has more to it, right? Than, than it has this spiritual meaning for the person who's living these things, but it also has a meaning in God's um, uh, creation, because, you know, history is his story. He's creating something on this planet. Um, and, and this is part of the story as he invites us to understand it and gives us uh, the kind of the times and seasons of it. The Sabbath represents also um, the millennial reign of the Messiah. It's the Sabbath of history, right? There is 
these stages, these years of history, and then there's the final 1,000 year rule, the Sabbath of history. It represents um, the end of the cycle of, of blood sacrifice, of transgression, of law, as we have the Sabbath uh, of our souls, you know, in, in, uh, in the Messiah, as we are forgiven once and for all and washed clean and redeemed and set right before God. So this, the weekly Sabbath is important. It's one of the appointed days of God. Now, this particular attack happened, happened on the weekly Sabbath, right? It happened on one of the appointed days of God. It was October 7th, right? It was a Saturday. Now, October 7th wasn't just any Saturday. When you look at the fall feasts, the fall appointed days of God, which have to do with the second coming, since the spring ones were uh, activated during the first coming, the, the, the fall days, this one happened on the eighth day of the final biblical feast. So the one they start with Passover in the spring and coming into the fall, they end with the Feast of Tabernacle, known in Hebrew as Sukkot. This is one of the appointed days of God. And if you think this doesn't matter anymore, have you noticed that according to the prophet Zechariah, the millennial reign of the Messiah begins on Sukkot, begins on this Feast of Tabernacle, right? It, it says... Then in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16, and all the survivors from all the nations that attacked Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, Adonai Tzfaut, the Lord of heaven's armies, and to celebrate tabernacles, to celebrate Sukkot. Every year, people will go up for a thousand years to celebrate Sukkot, to celebrate tabernacles. So this Old Testament Torah feast is still active in the millennial kingdom that's ahead of us. So don't tell me that, you know, that, that these days are somehow, you know, cast out or something. That doesn't make sense. The, 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 the Lord would never, he, he said that nothing would be removed from his instructions until all was fulfilled. So, so this, is, this has a meaning. And the, this particular feast um, has seven days. And then there is a solemn assembly to be held on the eighth day of Sukkot. It is elevated in some ways beyond the seven days of the feast. The first day is to be a Sabbath rest and this last day is a Sabbath rest. And then there is the eighth day of a solemn assembly and that fell on October 7th. So it was a double Sabbath. Not only was it, was it the Sabbath of the last day of this particular appointed day, these all mean something, and we're still discovering them. Why are there seven days and an eighth day? And why are there so many sacrifices? There's, you know, for instance, there's 70 sacrifices done throughout the week. It's believed that that refers to the nations and maybe even to the sons of God behind the nations. The eighth day on the solemn assembly day, there is one sacrifice, a bull. Some have said that represents then Israel. So there's there's these offerings. They all, and the days, the number of days, why eight? Well, we'll find out when the Lord comes back. All of these things will be activated. We'll know, you know. So on the very last day of this particular uh, appointed day, we, so the Lord says in Leviticus 23, so on the 15th day of the seventh month, which fell on September 29, when you have gathered in the fruits of the land, you are to keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. The first day is to be a Sabbath rest and the eighth day will also be a sabbath rest so the lord elevates the first and eighth day of sukkot of the feast of tabernacle which by the way is the beginning of the millennial kingdom in zachariah chapter 14 the eighth day that is when it happened on this holy day and it was a double sabbath it was a double appointed day it was first the weekly Sabbath. That's an appointed day of the Lord. It has a meaning. God selected it. It's not just like, you know, a day of rest. It has it has meaning on multi, multiple levels in the work of God and the mystery of God, both internally and externally on the pages of history. And then the eighth day of this particular appointed day, October 7th, that's when it happened. Now, it just so happens that October 7th was the anniversary 
of a war that happened on another appointed day, the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And they, this particular, the distance between the two wars, two wars on two appointed days. One was the Day of Atonement on October 6th, 1973. And you go forward 50 days plus one, October 7th. They chose 50 day plus one. They wanted to attack on Sabbath and on a holiday. You know, I, I, I don't like that we know we call this a Jewish holidays. This is not a holiday, right? This is this is not a holiday. This is this is one of you know God before the creation of man, uh, you know, appoints the, the relationship between the earth, the moon, and the sun to serve as a calendar for these days that God will. Uh, you know, begin incredible mysteries on the stage of history that will change the destiny of humanity and the destiny of the universe and, and the destiny of the created order. You want to call this a holiday, you can call it a holiday. It is the appointed day of the Lord, right? So the last war on the 50th, um, 50 years ago, the Yom Kippur War, this one now, they chose Saturday because it was the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, and everyone was involved in resting and worshiping. And it was also, you know, this eighth day uh, of Sukkot, which is supposed to be a day of exceeding joy. And um, it's combined it kind of the solemn assembly melts into something else, which is called Simchat Torah, which uh, celebrates the end of the reading cycle of the books of Moses and the beginning of the next cycle. And I'm going to talk about this. So this is, was, you know, another appointed day, 50 years apart. Now, why is that important, the 50? The 50 is um, a number that we see in the Bible as being the uh, the end of one cycle and the beginning of the next. Like there is 7 times 7, 49 plus 1 is 50, and now begins a new cycle. So there is the year of Jubilee where inheritance is returned to people and life resets whatever you've lost, it's, it's a new beginning. There is the fact that from unleavened bread, you count, you know, 49 plus one on the 50th day, it's when the Holy Spirit arrives, Pentecost or Shavuot, and now begins uh, a new beginning. You know, the uh, the message goes out and the, um, not first the Jews and then the Gentiles are called into the harvest of the Lord begins. Um, and when you look at the prophecy of Daniel, uh, chapter 9 about the 70th week it, that in 490 years divided into um, periods of seven weeks seven years you know uh, each one of these weeks is a seven-year period so in the 77 year periods God accomplishes his purposes that all have to do with the redemption of of humanity and the establishment of his kingdoms you know 490 years and there's a gap of 10 years to 500, which would be like, like a multiple of 50, right? And that's the millennial kingdom, right? Between uh, when he returns and when, you know, the father comes. So, so that's what the 10 clearly, you know, is, is, is talking about. So God has really organized things, right? And he, that's why when the Lord was asked, do you know, uh, when he was asked, when, when are you going to come back? And he said, I don't know the timing. Only the Father does. But there is a timing to be known, right? And these appointed days are used as a way of communicating to us the intentions of God, the mystery, the secret behind, you know, a world events. There, there is there is something here. So the 50 says to me that, you know, the, whatever the consequence of the Yom Kippur War, the 1973 war, that ended the war with the Arab world. No Arab coalition of countries ever attacked after 1973. You know, they organized in 1967, you know, in 1956, there was a war, but 1948, but 1948, 67, 73, the three big wars, the Arab world, there was this coalition of nations organized with the Soviet Union behind them to attack. 1973 ended that. There were no more. You know, there were skirmishes. There was, you know, with Lebanon, there were skirmishes with uh, West Bank, with Gaza, but there were just skirmishes. And there was also a peace, as armistice signed with the greatest Arab nation, uh, the greatest Arab power, which was Egypt at that time, as a result of the Yom Kippur of 1973. So there was a prolonged period of peace that followed the, the war that happened 50 days ago on an appointed day. And that led to, you know, Israel prospering. Um, it, 
it led to a lot of a lot of events that happened in the Middle East. But but that was a really for Israel, a time of peace and prosperity going from 1973 all the way um, to to this day. It's a rough neighborhood, so when you're there, you're kind of more used to skirmishes and things like that. You kind of grow a bit of a tougher skin living in that environment. But there was no more of these wars like the one we're witnessing suddenly today. But when the 50 years were over, 50 years plus one, boom, suddenly we see, you know, something got activated. And this got activated on a Sabbath day, an appointed day of God, and it got activated on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacle, which is elevated as to be the final day, a special day, one sacrifice is offered, not 70, and it is um, um, to be a solemn assembly and a Sabbath day. Um, so it's a, it's, it means something. You know, we're going to find out when the Lord comes what it means. Perhaps that is the day that his kingdom begins. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I don't want to, you know, speak for the Lord without knowing, but I can see that it means something, right? And that was 50 plus one. So we've got this appointed day a uh, signaling system that has been turned on. This war occurred on such an appointed day, like the last one, which was very significant, right? So that's one signal. There's the Sabbath, that's an, an appointed day, that's not a signal. There is the 50, this number, right? Which is um, another signal that has been turned on. And when I look at, for instance, um, is there a theme running through all of this? Um, for me, the theme seems to be that of a new beginning, because when you look at, for instance, uh, this Feast of Tabernacle, it's the feast of the ingathering of the harvest. You plant a seed, it grows, and you harvest it. That's the harvest of the faithful. That's why the millennial kingdom begins. The Lord is bringing even the enemies, it says, come and worship him, right? So it's the ingathering of people into his kingdom. It's the end of the cycle. I mean, when does the history of Israel begin? At Exodus. But when does it begin? Really on Passover, when the Lord calls, you know, the mountain says, you're going to start counting this will be the first of your months. And on the 14th day of Nisan, right, you're going to, you're going to have this Passover of the Lord. So their history really begins on Passover, the first of the appointed days. And then when you look at the prophetic word of Zechariah in chapter 14, when does it, this period of exodus to millennial kingdom to the land of milk and honey this idea that israel comes out to fulfill these covenants that god has made with abraham isaac and jacob later with david you know through his son these covenants that are being made you know as, as they're being fulfilled when does it end and a new beginning begins the millennial kingdom well according to zechariah chapter 14 it happens on the feast of tabernacle then all the survivors from all the nations that attacked Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate tabernacle, the feast of Sukkot, the last of the appointed days. This, this eight-day feast is seven days plus one day feast. That, you know, and the, it was in the plus one day that, you know, the, um, the, the attack happened. It was on the eighth day. And it's interesting, it was, it was also 50 plus one day, going back to the Yom Kippur War, right? This... this this is signaling something that that the that the the numbers of God and the signaling system of the Lord are being activated here, and so the history of Israel begins on Egypt on Passover ends in Jerusalem on the Feast of Tabernacle. It ends up being a three thousand year journey, as you know the this particular system of feast from Passover to Tabernacle essentially is recording in a spiral form the accomplishing of the works of God throughout history. And of course, they get really brought to life through the coming of his son, through the coming of the Messiah, and how this is important for the work of the redemption for, for humanity, for the Jew and the Gentile, and the one man and Messiah that is born and enters into the kingdom on this uh, Feast of Tabernacles. So for me, it is the feast also of the end of one work, like it's the end of the cycle, and the beginning of the millennial kingdom. It is the, the end of the cycle of agriculture. If you want to use agriculture as a metaphor, as an allegory for the work of God that seeds are planted and the land itself is testifying of the processes of God's work, this is a new beginning, right? 50 is a new beginning. 
um, the Feast of Sukkot is the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom and the end of the story that begins in Exodus. The history of Israel begins in Exodus on Passover and ends on Sukkot uh, at the second coming of the Lord, right? And then begins the Millennial Kingdom. Now, this idea of um, the lectionary, you know, of the Jewish people, it is an ancient lectionary. You know, when you see the Lord go into the synagogue of Nazareth and they give him, there's there's always a reading from the books of Moses and a reading from the prophets. They give him the reading from the prophets and he reads from uh, Isaiah 61 and he says, you know, about uh, how the uh, Messiah is going to deliver people from bondage. And he, and he says, this is kind of, you know, fulfilled in your sight today. But basically there was this lectionary that was the reading for that week he didn't choose to read that they gave it to him and the families that lived in 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 Netzeret, in that in nazareth would take turns to read and that was the turn of his family and he got up and he read that day and it just so happened to fall the reading fell on something that pertained to him right maybe that was the year of jubilee because it talks about Jubilee in that prophecy of Isaiah 61. And perhaps that was him declaring the freedom, because that's what Jubilee is. It's freedom from bondage and re the return of inheritance. So, so that is it's possible, again, you know, these, these days of the Lord. So the, what's interesting is that this ancient lectionary of the Jewish people also on this weekend of this attack, October 7th and 8th, ends. And immediately begins like they read the last they read the in the end of Deuteronomy and then they be, they read the beginning of Genesis. So what happens is that it shows again the end of one cycle and the beginning of next. It's a new beginning. The 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 fifty plus one that's a new beginning. The feast of the harvest that is the end of the cycle of feasts. The end of the work of God in history. Eventually at the second coming. Um, it is a new beginning of the millennial kingdom. It's it's a new beginning. Now you now you have the 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 reading of the lectionary. That's not you know one of the appointed days of God. It's something that was added, but it's an ancient one, and it and it has meaning in the life of the Messiah when he reads from it. So what's interesting is that it's the end of the cycle of the lectionary and the beginning of the new reading. And when you when you begin to read the Bible all over again, where do you begin? Well, you begin in the book of Genesis or Bereshit, which is the name of the book of Genesis in Hebrew. It means in the beginning, right? It's taken from the very first words of the Bible. The very first was the Torah. And, our, you know, John in his gospel uses that as well, right? So he, you know, in the beginning saying that basically, equating God the creator with 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 God the son right so basically this whole idea uh that God enters the world in a visible image uh that's what John is trying to convey here but basically again you know there's this the end of the cycle the beginning and the, you read in the beginning that's when you it was and the Sabbath itself you know the Saturday of the attack that is the end of the weekly cycle right and a new beginning so when I look at um, the signaling system, whether it's the fact that um, when I go deeper into, okay, well, we now know it's an appointed day, but what else do we see here? I see new beginning, right? This is a new beginning. God is going to do something new. There's a new beginning here. And what, as they kind of start to ponder, you know, how they should respond to this whole thing, um, there's a, you know, there's, they're going to actually attack and then there's a delay. We don't really know. I mean, you know, in the fog of war, you can't really believe anything like why did they delay? There's reasons Well, there was the weather, there was this, but really who knows? We don't, they're not going to tell us, right? It's a war. But there's a delay and, and suddenly another one of God's appointed times in the Bible activates in, in the midst of this delay. And that is the new moon, Rosh Chodesh. So when God gives us this calendar that, you know, encodes his prophetic intentions, um, you have to be able to count it. So what's the first day of the month? How do you do that? Well, it's going to be the new moon. So, you know, the moon waxes and wanes. 
and and so then it goes kind of completely dark you can't see it and then suddenly it appears and you see it that's the new moon and god says you're going to make that the first day right it's a lunar solar calendar and there are sacrifices to be offered at the temple on that day it's as though the month is being dedicated as holy to god and um in in this cycle of months then there's like on 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 you know on the 15th day of the seventh month you're going to do the the beginning of the feast of tabernacle so now you have a way of calculating it but the new moon appears um on saturday october 14th the ninth fall to monday october 16th you know because they take two days because depending on whether you live in israel or in the diaspora they, but that becomes the 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 period of the new moon right so another one appears suddenly but that then propels israel into a new month a new beginning appears again and that is the month of cheshvan that is the month we're in right now which month is that the eighth month now this the we got the eighth day of the feast of tabernacle eight is a new beginning because seven is a complete cycle eight is a new beginning you know you're circumcised on the eighth day apparently if you take lord jesus christ in greek and and you know that every greek word is also a number it spells 888 so eight is a new beginning right you know yeshua hamashiach is is a new beginning so the, we're in the eighth month um of the biblical calendar and now that is a new beginning and what happens during this new moon that appears an eclipse occurs an eclipse occurs and you, you know this eclipse is visible from america an eclipse of the sun occurs the ring of fire and so that's interesting because we were told in the beginning of the book of genesis that there's appointed days that the relationship between the sun the earth and the moon was for days and years for appointed days holy days of god and for signals which are the eclipses so suddenly the new moon is a is a biblical principle that god points out to count the months and their sacrifices that activates it's the new beginning of a new month it is the eighth month which is again number eight is the number of a new beginning uh the sign of the eclipse is given on that new moon day of this new month the lectionary starts all over again uh, with the book of Genesis. Um, the, uh, the, the war happens on the eighth day of Sukkot, which is, again, the last day of it, the holy day, and then a new beginning. The, the kingdom of God begins on Sukkot. The story of Israel ends on the Feast of Tabernacle that begins in Egypt. The, the gap between the two wars that occur on these appointed days are 50 plus one, again, a new beginning. And then when you look at this week that we find ourselves in right now, right now is October 17th. And now we, with the lectionary of the Jewish people have started again. And, and where are we now in this lectionary? Um, so if you look at it, this is, we are now in the portion called Noah. This, where we are in right now, remembers the story of the flood. This is the, the eighth month, the month of Cheshvan. And what do you read? Genesis 6, 9 to Genesis eleven thirty two. Now, if you go to Genesis 6, 11, it says, and was corrupt the earth before, God. okay, I'm, okay. Uh, I'm, this is just, you know, the literal translation. Um, it talks about how, you know, the, the world was corrupt um, and the, the word Hamas appears in this week's lectionary. Let me just read it in proper kind of, you know, um, first let's read it. When man began to mold, so now on the earth, the, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. And the word sometimes is translated as lawlessness. This is the word Hamas, right? So it's an Arabic word. It means zeal. It's the, an acronym for an Islamic organization, but it's also a Hebrew word. And it happens to appear in this week's lectionary, which happens to be the week that they are pondering, uprooting this organization and attacking uh, Gaza, 
right? Now, where does the word appear in scripture? It appears in the context of the days of Noah and the days of the world before the flood, which was the days of the sons of God and the Nephilim. And it says the whole earth was filled with the spirit. So it's a spirit of um, an evil spirit and, and it has a name. Um, so let's go back to the Hebrew here. And so the earth was corrupted because they, 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 these, this kind of idolatry, this ways that came from the sons of God filled the earth. It was not only the implementation of their children, but also the knowledge they imparted to the earth. And, and so when you kind of look at um, Genesis 6, chapter 11, it says, and was corrupt the earth before God was filled with the earth with lawlessness or violence. It's kind of something that goes against the ways of God with Hamas. It's right here, right? So this week's lectionary has this word. And what is this week's lectionary about the flood? What is the flood? The cleansing of evil. And what happens after the flood? A new beginning happens. A second creation occurs. One more time, the dry land appears, like the beginning of the book of Genesis. So it's like a second creation. One more time, man walks into the earth for the first time. And what is the first thing we do to worship God, to sacrifice to God? And that's what Adam and Eve were created for, right? So I find this, this fascinating. Um, basically, so let's just put this together again, right? The, the signaling systems have been turned on galore by god it's like right and and the timing of the lord there's something going on here which is of the lord right this is not a normal war it's a spiritual attack against the purposes of god and i think this signaling system is telling us god's like i know and and i know i knew even before it happened and 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 i just want you guys to know that that I know because he's put this system of communication into place for us in the Bible. So it happens 50 years plus one after a war that occurred on an appointed day in 1973. It happens on an appointed day, which is the last of the cycle of the appointed days and that of a new beginning. It happens on the eighth day the holy day of that of, of that of the feast of tabernacle and it is the number of new beginning 50 plus one new beginning 50 year gap you know new beginning the actual feast of tabernacle where this particular war occurs on in the bible itself marks the beginning of the messianic kingdom of, of, the, of the messiah on earth when he returns a new beginning it happens on the Sabbath, which the weekly Sabbath, which is the end of a cycle and a new beginning of the next week. It happens, it's a holy day. It happens um, at the end of the lectionary of the Jewish people as they end one cycle of reading. It's a scroll, right? You, you know, scrolls go on forever. It's round and round you go. It's a scroll. It ends and then it begins again. It's a new beginning. And then what you read is the book of the beginning. And it just so happens that as they're kind of talking about this and what to do, the new moon appears, which is the new beginning. And it happens to, to announce the eighth month, which is the number eight is a new beginning. It happens to be the, the month always in which the story of the flood is read, which is the cleansing of this thing that is mentioned by name in the reading of this week, Hamas. And the reemergence of a new beginning, which is the new creation after the flood. Um, I want to make sure I covered all the uh, the things that I've pulled out so far in my notes. I think I have. So for me, the signal that I'm getting is is the new beginning. I mean, I don't want to make this up. Perhaps put in the if you see something else in this, please let me know. But it seems that it's saying new beginning, new beginning, new beginning. And so when I kind of kind of compare this to world events i go well what was happening right now just before this war broke out well it looks like the president of the most important country in the world united states of america president biden and the leader of this na of the nation of israel 
um, the, you know, dear to God, an important history here. It is, um, um, and the leader of Saudi Arabia. Now, what is in Saudi Arabia? The two mosques of Mecca and Medina, which are the most sacred sites of Islam. Mecca, you know, well, everyone knows Mecca, right? That's in Saudi Arabia. And the family of Saud is the custodian of Mecca. Making normalization with that country would send reverberations into the entire Muslim world. It would really weaken the jihadi movement because it was like, okay, you know, the people, many other people in the Muslim world would be like, okay, you know what? It looks like we've normalized with Israel. So suddenly Biden, Netanyahu, and the prince of Saudi Arabia, MBS as it's called, come out in the context of what? The United Nations Assembly, which happens when? During another one of God's appointed days. Just before the Feast of Tabernacle, you had the Day of Atonement, right? And so you have the first um, of the month of Tishrei, and then you have a 10-day gap, and then you have the Day of Atonement. And, and both the first, the 10-day gap, and the, and the day, all of that is designed by God in the book of Leviticus. The, the United Nations Assembly occurs in that gap in the midst of the Day of Atonement, which is also a day of judgment, because you're, you're, you know, and so maybe judgment is given to the nations. I mean, the eclipse of the sun, what does that mean? Well, it, it's kind of a mystery, but this is how it's usually, you know, understood that since the empires of the Gentiles had a solar calendar of 360 days, and Israel had a lunar calendar that the sun, eclipse of the sun is for the nations, the eclipse of the moon is for Israel. But the problem is the word nation is also applied to Abraham in the book of Genesis. He is himself the word that's later applied to the Gentiles, goim, it also applied to Abraham. So the question is, well, does the sun actually is a sign for both Israel and the nations and the moon only for Israel? Or is the sun for the nations and the moon for Israel? This is a debate that hasn't been resolved, right? So there is there is something, you know, the, the United Nations Assembly um occurs you know all these nations come during the appointed day of god this fall and it's as though it's also the time of judgment the weighing of scales and suddenly you know the leader of israel decides to say yes we're we're close they give all these interviews we're close to what they call it the new middle east like it's a new beginning for the middle east they're about to do it they're both the Leader of Saudi Arabia makes a uh, you know think um, an interview with Fox uh, net, uh, television. So does the leader of Israel and the president of the United States. They they all announce that they're very close, and eventually they give it the name, the New Middle East. Actually, I had an article. Um, I had Googled it. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes I I prepare things and I do research and research, and then uh, it gets lost. But if you just Google New, uh, New Middle East, you'll get you know New York Times as an article. Uh, and, and so it's like, wow, this is important. They're about to announce a new Middle East, right? So I wonder, I'm still praying about this. I, did the Lord suddenly say, no, I'm, I'm not happy with this. This is, doesn't work for me. I'm the one that's going to be, you know, basically announcing the Lord saying, I'm going to announce a new beginning, a new Middle East. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, is this what's happening? Is this why this signaling system of new, 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 began now and uh, of a new beginning? I don't know. I'm still praying and meditating about this. Now, in Daniel chapter two, we are told, um, what are we told? We, we to Daniel says that, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. So the Lord is the one, and he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So he's the one that sets up kings and removes kings. So God is the, that's why his name is plural, Elohim. It means that he's the leader of all the spiritual authorities. If you like read Colossians 1, verse 16, he's the leader of all the spiritual authorities. So, you know, man and angel, fallen or righteous, he's the leader of all the spiritual authorities. He's the authority of authorities. When it comes to the fact that he's created conscious beings and there's governance in his creation, there's order, he is the one sitting on the throne. The Lord is sitting on the throne 
of the creation. Never forget that when you look outside the window. Don't get confused about who's in charge. The son of God, the son of King David, the one and only God. He is in charge. Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the savior, the redeemer, the ruler of heaven and earth. The scepter of rule has been given to him, the son of man, and it comes to the ancient of his days and receives it. And we see that's what happened when the Lord ascended. So he's sitting at the right hand of God and waiting, you know, until God makes a footstool for all his enemies. And like Psalm 110 says, and he sends him back to usher in the new beginning, the kingdom, the millennial rule. And, and that's where we're headed, this Feast of Tabernacle. We have a rendezvous with the Lord on the Feast of Tabernacle. So basically, um, the Lord is in charge of the kings. He is the one that decides the shuffling of, of power structures. That's what the book of Daniel says. And how would this happen? Well, there are these wars mentioned. Uh, there's one in the book of Psalms, Psalm 83. The, and and these, these are patterns. And of course, there's the very famous prophecy of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And this could be the beginning of that war, you know. And it could kind of climax, because I think it's going to happen in stages, because I, I can see that the coalition of nations is not ready. But this spirit of Hamas, which is mentioned as belonging to the world before the flood and mentioned in this week's lectionary reading in the ancient Jewish lectionary at the time where those people, the Jewish people, are getting ready to deal with it, like in the person, in the physical. Right. You know, we can support with prayer. But imagine you're in the midst of it. You know, you, the plan of God is unfolding and the enemy needs to take you out in order for these plans to, to, to stop, for the prophecies not to be fulfilled. And, and, and that's why we must support it because our destinies are intertwined with Israel. Look what it says. Um, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun as a light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars as a light by night, who stirs up the sea so it waves its waves roar. Other nights felt the Lord of hosts is his name. Only if this fixed order departs from before me is a declaration of the night, then also might Israel's offspring cease from being a nation before me. So for all time. So God is saying, look, as long as the order of the heavens is operational, you know, with the sun, the moon, the stars, then Israel will continue to remain a nation before me. And this is given at a time that the scroll of Jeremiah is written in the time of the Babylonian exile. So, so it's, just, it's like a time of today where there's been a judgment, an exile, a dispersion, and it's tempting in that gap to start reimagining the place of Israel in biblical prophecy and history and, and, and to erase them off the pages of the Bible, which is a form of attack against God. But yet so... You, you know, so foundational to so much of the church's thinking, you know, perhaps these things also helped lead to things like the Inquisition, like the Holocaust, the enemy, you know, tries to destroy the ones about whom the prophecies of the Bible are about, right? The, the Lord says he does nothing other than that which he speaks through his servants, the prophets. But so the Lord goes beforehand at the time of where he disowns and, and, and throws people out of the land, his tenants, and takes them to Babylon. At that time, he says, by the way, you know, just in case anybody has any ideas, these the Israel is a nation before me for all time, uh, as long as the fixed order you know, of the creation exists. And that we see the names of the tribes on the heavenly Jerusalem. We see Paul talk about how the promises to the patriarchs are irrevocable. So we are to pay attention to what is happening in the Holy Land and to these people for the salvation and redemption of the world, the completion of the work of the Messiah, as he comes to physically heal the world and usher in a new age of history. The birth pangs have begun clearly, and now we're going to see kind of the contractions get smaller and smaller. Um, they say, you know, the birth pangs began in 1947, 1948. And 47 is interesting because, you know, that's 20 years later was the 1967 war, which made Jerusalem part of the commonwealth it was a miraculous war and that was a very important war because the arab nations that attacked israel were all led by secular socialist leaders supported by the soviet union when they lost in such a strange and quick way they were so roundly defeated in six days you know 
um, the five Arab nations. There was that's what was called the Six Day War, commemorating, by the way, the six days of creation. That you know they they called it that. That something new was formed, and a new Middle East. And so what happened was, the the Muslim side thought, oh, you know, the clerics said we attacked with secular leadership. That's why we lost. We must first Islamize, Islamicize, and then attack in the name of Allah. And that's what's been going on. And now this new war, which is an Islamic war of non-Arab countries, by the way, you know, so the, the 1973 war kind of ended the, you know, the struggle with Arab coalitions. It seems that this one is coming from an orbit that's one orbit removed from the Arab nations. Iran, Turkey, um, some African countries are involved. This is, you know, perhaps, you know, the Afghanistan has a new Taliban leader, you know, which is part of the Muslim Brotherhood, the same group as Hamas. And, and you have all of these Islamic um, uh, horror, um, uh, movements, you know, in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. So this is kind of like, you know, but it's an Islamic war, right? It's not like 1967. So it's possible that we have another war, a miraculous victory. And this is the Ezekiel 38, 39. And these guys come and when they're defeated, their ideology ceases to exist because they realize, everyone realizes God was with Israel. All the religious people in the Middle East realize God was with Israel, right? So I find it interesting. Um, if that's the case, then maybe it'll happen like 1947 led to 1967. Maybe we're looking at 2027. We'll see. You know, so this is maybe the beginning of of a process, you know, that, that this is going to have steps, right? Or maybe it could accelerate really quickly. It could just accelerate really quickly like that and turn into a series of events that bring these prophecies of Ezekiel and Psalms to life and usher in a new beginning for the Middle East as God gives victory. And we see the defeat of this spirit of violence in this spirit of Hamas and this spirit of Islamic Jihad. And, you know, I don't, maybe I shouldn't say these words for AI, I don't know. But you know what I mean? Like this, this, this spirit that suppresses the people of the region, attacks the will of God, attacks Israel. Israel is standing in the way of the ambitions of this movement to create a global um you know um the universalism of islam suddenly it looks like they're trying to do this but israel standing in the way and so the firepower is turning in that direction right and of course we know that that it's the god of israel that is really uh behind israel and standing in their way and so these signaling systems that have been activated from that i just mentioned the beginning of this talk i think tell me that god is saying be comforted I've got this, it's in my hands, it's going to lead somewhere, and maybe there'll be the defeat of the Islamic Republic of Iran, maybe the defeat of Hamas and other, you know, Islamist forces, and a new Middle East will begin come up where there'll be reprieve for the people, and uh, the name of God will be glorified, even in the sight of the enemies of Israel, and there will be a change of heart and mind, there'll be a spiritual transformation for them, there'll be a spiritual transformation for the Jewish people, because that's what we see at the end of the book of Ezekiel, and the world will know, be like the 1967 war, the seculars attacked, they lost. The Arab nations attacked, they lost. This time, the non-Arabic nations attacked. An Islamic war occurs, and they lose again, and that ends it. And I think that that maybe this is what the pattern is that is happening once again on an appointed day, like the one that happened 50 years ago. And by the way, Israel declares war this time. He, they just invoked Article 40 LF of the law, and when was the last time they declared war and, and 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 activated that article of law? 50 years ago, during the war that happened on the appointed day of the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur War. So this, I don't know if they're going to call it the Sukkot War, they're going to call it the Simchat Torah War. The name is, is out. Uh, the jury is out on the name for this war. And I think there's perhaps other things people have in mind in naming it. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to, in this video, kind of say, hey, I think the signaling systems have been turned on galore and they're all pointing, it seems to me, to eight, to a new beginning, to the end of the cycles, to the beginning of new cycles, whether it's the appointed day, the reading of the scroll, the book of the beginning, and the removal of the very thing that is mentioned in this week's uh, uh, Parsha or, you know, reading, um, which happens to be the story of, of the rise of the spirit of Hamas before the days of, of the flood as it corrupts the earth and God kind of removes it. So how is this going to happen in our day? Is it going to be a flood? No, it's going to be wars. 
And it's and it's kind of like the birth pang. You know, when I look back at what God says to the woman that will have birth through the childhood, there'll be pain. I see now it's like the metaphor of there is this pain and conflict that gives birth, you know, to a new age of history. Ultimately, the second coming, we see the new age of history begin, the Messianic kingdom, the Sabbath of history. But also this happens in shorter forms throughout history where there is moments where things come to head and then boom you get you give birth to a new age so maybe a new middle east is about to be born but not the one that biden had in mind the one that god has in mind and it might be a better one you know that the one that they're trying to negotiate so we'll see but i'm hopeful that the um hand of god is behind all of this and we can be comforted of course these are the signs of the times what time is it it's the time of the coming of the Lord. And we know that we have to make sure that we live our lives in connection with that, our, our identity and the larger understanding of who God is and the fact that he sits on the throne and we're in a great story moving forward. That is, we have to live our life with that and recognize these signs and other times and share and comfort people. So share this video, subscribe if you want to know what the next update is. I have another update that has to do specifically about Iran that I'm putting together. It's very interesting. I think you're going to really enjoy that. So subscribe, hit the bell. I hear people say these things. I'm supposed to say this. Share. If you go to my website, thinkingandproductions.com, you can sign up for the newsletter. If you go to the, you know, on the front page of the website, you can go to the Patreon and, and, and support me on Patreon as well as listen to the audio series in the book of Revelation. So um, I hope that this, this was edifying for you, knowing that God's, uh, hand is behind all Israel and behind all of this. And he is the one going forward in battle, mighty in battle. And he is the one uh, that is going to bring about a victory and a new beginning uh, for the Middle East. And it's going to be far greater than what we have in mind. Um, so um, take comfort knowing that the hand of God, you know, the tabernacle of God is over this entire thing. God bless you all. Until next time.